Today, we're going to recap Lincoln Riley's spring practice presser, and it's chock full of information, and all that's coming up after the bumper. What do you mean you don't subscribe to my son's YouTube channel? Mama, no! Just snap the damn ball, RJ. What's up, kid folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button, because I upload a video every single day. It's always OU related, college football related, sports related. We have a good time, and today, we're going to recap Lincoln Riley's spring practice football press conference, starting with, hey man, check it out. What I've been saying all along is what they're doing on defense. They're trying to get bigger at smaller positions and smaller at bigger positions. Lincoln Riley emphasized that part of the winter training was to kind of trim up the defensive tackles, defensive ends, and make the DBs a bit longer, as much as you can make anybody longer, but recruit to longer DBs, and also make them a little bit bigger for what Alex Grinch is trying to do. One of the things I found really interesting is throughout this entire 35-minute press conference, Lincoln Riley refused to say what kind of formation they were running. He was just trying to say that they would be more aggressive, that they would be fast, and there's a way for which they're going to measure this that we'll get into a little bit later. But bigger at smaller positions, smaller at bigger positions, that's one of the emphasis. Next takeaway was the injury situation. They're going to go throughout spring practice without Creed Humphrey, without Robert Barnes, without Jordan Parker, without Jalen Redman, and without Starlin Baldwin. Now, some of these Lincoln Riley said the expected. I think Creed becomes the most surprising of all of these, but also means you're going to go through the entire spring with brand new linemen. Now, this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because, as Lincoln pointed out, you're going to get to figure out where a lot of your guys are individually who might have been able to depend on a guy like Creed Humphrey who knew everybody's position and everybody's assignment, and you're going to force them to grow up. The other part about this is they're probably going to get beat up a lot because you're breaking in an entirely new offensive line if you're Bill Beatonbow. But if anybody knows how to make that work and anybody can turn that lemon into lemonade, it's that guy. Next takeaway is that the Michael Thompson position change to offensive line seems permanent. Now, Lincoln went out of his way to say, first, we recruited this guy on offensive line, and then we decided that we wanted to play defensive tackle. He blew out his ACL, and by some accounts, he put on some weight during his rehab. Now, I think that was also calculated. I don't think the kid was lazy. I think that he expected to play the zero technique in a Mike Stoop scheme, and part of that was trying to make him bigger and stronger. Now, with a new defense coordinator where you're trying to get smaller at that position, you just decide to say, hey, we're a little thin on the offensive line, and maybe Michael Thompson can help us out. And this is a guy who was a four-star defensive tackle, an Army All-American, and I think Bill Beatonbow has some tools there because perhaps you're looking at Bray Walker on the other side of a Michael Thompson or on the other side of a Daryl Simpson. We'll just have to wait and see. Next takeaway is that A.D. Miller is back at Oklahoma. We all thought that he was gone to Illinois, and Lincoln Riley and the staff thought he was gone to Illinois. Illinois even announced him as a wide receiver on their social media last month. But it seems that he saw something he didn't like and called the coach to see if they would take him back. And it turns out they could take him back and not give up the scholarship for this year. And that's a really big deal because you don't want to go into Hawk on a scholarship that you obviously want to use and need here. And it bears mentioning that Lincoln did not mention Ron Tatum or Derek Green or any kind of a defensive line grad transfer. However, those things still might be in play. But getting A.D. Miller back for a wide receiver core that he said was thin, which is interesting to me because you got four brand new guys that, are, that you absolutely trust and a C.D. Lamb and a Charleston Rambo and others. So we'll get to see what that means as spring practice goes. The big one that I took away from this is the April 13th spring game is going to be bigger than last year's spring game. 52,000 people attended that spring game in terrible weather and still broke the spring game school record at Oklahoma by 9,000. And he's already expecting a bigger group of recruits to this event. And they're putting a lot of emphasis on it because it was so successful last year. And when they talked to the 11 guys that attended the spring game last year that are Sooners now, every one of them said the spring game event was a really big deal for them choosing Oklahoma. So he's asking folks to come out and be about it for the spring game on April 13th. The next one, and the title of this video, is that he believes Tanner Mordecai is still going to compete for the job and Jalen Hurts doesn't have the thing wrapped up. Now, a lot of folks are in the Tanner Mordecai truth or camp about this kick and absolutely spin it. If you saw him at Waco Midway, you saw a guy that passed 4,000, rushed 4,000, and can lead a team. Now, Jalen Hurts also has a national title ring and was the SEC offensive player of the year as a freshman 
and absolutely came here to be the starting quarterback. So nobody really believes that Jalen Hurts is not going to be the starter come week one, kind of like the whole Kyler Austin Kendall thing last year. But it bears mentioning that he's at least giving lip service to Tanner Mordecai having a shot at this job, and you want to keep Tanner Mordecai's head in the game because you only got two quarterbacks that you trust on scholarship on campus. Now, as far as the defensive assistants go and the coordinator, he's loving this with Roy Manning, Brian Odom, and Alex Grinch and what they bring because they bring a new philosophy, but they also bring new energy and a new mentality toward playing defense. He was really adamant that one of the things that he loved about Alex Grinch and the way that they're deciding to play defense is that they want to play the game on their terms, which he said is the mirror image of what we do on offense. So if you can imagine a defense that's as good as Lincoln Riley is on offense, nobody in the world should be able to beat that team. Now, it all remains to be seen. Again, he's calling it the speed D, and I get it, it's a speed D, but he didn't want to put a formation on it because, well... We'll wait and see. But I still think it's a 3-4 with a stand-up rush in. One of the reasons that he's trying to make a Ronnie Perkins kind of guy a little bit slimmer. And a guy like David Guaybu is going to fit right in. A guy like Joseph Wete is going to fit right in. And we'll see what that means for a guy like Mark Jackson in the coming months. Lincoln was also adamant that one of the reasons that he wanted Alex Grinch is because he believes that he had players on campus right now that fit the scheme that he wants to run. And they can be really good right away. I think that's what most of us have thought when we look at at the roster, we look at four-star, five-star guys on this roster, Caleb Kelly, Buki, and others to say there's no reason why you should not be able to be good on defense. And I know some people have been like, yo, why can't we recruit on defense like we recruit on offense? Well, because the defense ain't been as good as the offense. It's that simple. But now, if you can get an immediate turnaround with Alex Grinch's defense, and you can get something that really, really hums out there, it's going to be much easier to recruit this kind of defensive talent that we all crave to see on the Oklahoma team. Now, Lincoln, like I, did not appreciate Charlie Casterly opening his mouth about Kyler Murray for the same reasons that I think a lot of people do, which is he doesn't really know the kid. He hasn't talked to his coaches. He hasn't talked to anybody that played with him. He went to one disgruntled team that probably ain't going to be able to draft Kyler Murray and ran with that report. Now, no matter what you think about Charlie Casterly as a GM, the fact of the matter is he is a TV personality now, and what he says is going to ring out. It's one of the reasons that Lincoln Riley went on the Dan Patrick radio show to be like, look, this is garbage. He didn't say garbage. Garbage is my word. He didn't agree with it. He understands why the guy might have got that source from a team. But he talked to a bunch of teams that were over the moon about Kyler Murray. And he spoke about Cliff Kingsbury and the Kyler Murray matchup. And he was saying, look, yes, that absolutely could be good. But when he looks at Kyler Murray, he says, if you can't figure it out with that guy, you need to change what you're doing. Because everywhere that guy goes, he's won championships. And he made a really good point with that, which is, hey, he's won a championship at every team he's ever played on. Come on, get it right for your head. Now, offensively, Lincoln is going to stick to what he's been doing, which is overloading the offense, in particular quarterbacks, with information just to see how much they can retain and what's going to spill over. I think that's really cool, and I think that's also very good. also speaks to how smart Kyler would have to be to run his system. Because Jalen Hurts is getting the book thrown at him, just like Tanner Mordecai. And I think a lot of this is going to be how much can they really, really trust these guys to make decisions on their own. And when it comes time to tailor the playbook, they'll do that. But for now, everybody gets the full dose of the fire hose. Now, Lincoln also pointed to Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield and others as one of the reasons for which they're able to recruit so well. Because not only can you look at those guys and see number one overall draft picks and Heisman Trophy winners, but he made a really good point in that when you look at the guys from Oklahoma who make it to the next level, who make it to the NFL, not too many of them flame out. Most of them are making it to that next contract where there's some real money to be had. And he's making a really good point, even to a guy like Tony Jefferson, who went undrafted and now is the safety at Baltimore Ravens on a team where Eric Weddle was just let go. I think this is a really good take and one that he should use more often in public. Now, interestingly enough, Lincoln mentioned that Buki hasn't been healthy since the K-State game when he laid that absolute killer hit on the tight end there but apparently he's just kind of been sucking up and playing through it it's a guy who's been much maligned as they say hate that term for his play on the field particularly against West Virginia but they seem to think that they got a player in Buki and they seem to think that that guy can still play multiple positions and everybody's going to be open for evaluation at this point one of the ways that they're going to evaluate these guys also is with GPS tracking, which I think is one of the ways to go. It's going to show you how often these guys move, how fast they move, and how much ground they can cover. And in a defense where you're prioritizing speed, 
You also want to prioritize conditioning because being able to get up off the ball and run with guys is going to be a big part of playing defense. All right, I sped through that and I'll break it down a little bit more as we go on, but I want to give everybody a nice good overview of what we had to go on with Lincoln Ryland, what he said at his presser, which I thought was really good. All right, that's it for me. Deuces.